All right, uh, this morning we're going to look at, uh, once again, just finishing up this particular lesson, or this chart, which is uh, the importance of the fall of Jerusalem. We'll just look at the last one or two points here, because we've already gone over the chart, but then we're going to go to an overview. And what the overview does, I think, is probably help settle in our minds uh, the two halves of the book of Revelation, and just give us a general picture before we descend into the details, which will be after that. So we'll specifically look at the overview in just a few moments. It'll be, we'll have another chart on that or two, and we'll look at how that goes. So, all right, uh, that's where we are. Anything that we need to mention before we begin? Yes, ma'am. Go slow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Huh? Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, huh? Oh, I probably am. I always, that's, that's my chief fault. <laughs> okay, let's have a prayer before we begin. Lord in heaven, thank you once again for this day. We thank you, Father, for the Bible, the Word of God. We pray that you'll help us to be diligent students of it. We pray that you'll help us guide our thoughts and our hearts this morning. We pray that you'll help us to live these things as, as we see them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Say again. Oh, do I need to turn this one on too? I ain't never done that. I guess that's it. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, well. Huh? <laughs> Sounds like something's happening up here. <laughs> okay. Well, well, well. Thank you for that. See, uh, I, I've forgotten all about that one. <laughs> okay, let's look at the, at the last particular. Uh, we, and we noticed number nine, I think that's where we finished last week, separated the Jude, uh, Judaism from the church, and that is uh, in the minds of the Roman emperors, in the mind of people in the world. Uh, that's what the destruction of Jerusalem did. We're talking about that which occurred at 70. And we mentioned Acts chapter 28, verse 22, when Paul came to Rome finally. And it was pretty interesting to note the language that is there used. It's Acts 28, 22. That is, they're used where the Jews suppose the church to be a sect of Judaism. They, they suppose it to be a portion of Judaism. Now, that was the way that the Roman Empire thought of it. That's the way that many Jews thought of it. But that is not the case. And so the destruction of Jerusalem was important in the first century because it separated finely and cleanly in the minds of individuals that the church was not a part of Judaism. All right, any question on that? Any thoughts? The last point is that it also, that is the destruction of Jerusalem, settled the question as to the sons of God. Now, I want us to begin in this particular point to look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now, we'll just notice a couple of highlights in this chapter. This is so important as to who really are the children of God. And that's what I mean by sons of God. So <clears throat> we know in verse 6, that's what is quoted from the Old Testament. So even as Abraham believed God, it was counted or reckoned unto him for righteousness. All right, that's, that's the starting point with which he begins. That comes from Genesis 15 and verse 6. You'll have a note on your Bible on that. Then you have, know therefore that they that are of faith. Who are, they, who are those people? People of God are those who are children of faith the same as sons of Abraham. Are, are we children of faith? Yes, we are. Are we children of Abraham? Yes, we are. Well, the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So this is, in the promise to Abraham, those that are children of God or sons of God are those who are sons of God by faith. And that's his whole point here. And then as he tells us, verse 9, uh, verse 10 rather, 
as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. That is, if you want to be following the law, you're under a curse. And he tells us how that is the case. Cursed is everyone who continues not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. That is, you had to keep the law perfectly all the time. And if you want to be under the law, then that's how you're going to have to do it. That's not going to be a child of God by faith, however, is it? That's going to be a child of God by earning it. So the children of God by faith are those who are, and he goes on to show us, faith of Christ. And he, that's the next paragraph, verses 15 and following. So let's come down till, uh, to, um, let's come down to, uh, we'll start at verse 15. I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet when it has been confirmed, no one makes it void or add thereto. That is, even in a covenant, but that men make between themselves. Now to Abraham were the promises spoken unto his seed. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. That is, the seed refers to those who are in Christ. Now this I say, a covenant confirmed beforehand by God. When did that take place? The covenant by God confirmed to Abraham. When did that take place? Where in the Bible? Genesis. Genesis 15. This, he also quotes Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. Then he tells us, the law which came 430 years after, what about it? The law came later. It doesn't disannul so as to make the promise of none effect. That is, the promise is still in effect. The law didn't change that at all. It is, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by promise. So what then is the law? What was the law given for? Well, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was ordained through angels by the hand of a mediator. So now let's go down to verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept in ward under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. That is the faith, Christian faith, which should afterwards be revealed. What, what did the law do? Well, he says the law was that which kept us in ward. So that the laws have become our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith is come, you're no longer under a tutor. For you're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. All right, who are the sons of God? Those who are by, have faith in Christ Jesus are the faith of Christ Jesus. Those are the sons of God. And what was the po point of the law? It was simply to bring men to Christ. That's all. It was only a tutor to bring men to Christ. It was temporary. So he tells us we're sons of God by faith. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He explains what it is to be a child of God by faith. So the son of God by faith, and the whole point of the chapter is that Abraham was blessed, and the promise given to Abraham was that they would be children of God by faith. But he tells us that's not about the law. It's about those who have faith in Christ. And that's the point. So the sons of God, are we sons of God? Yes. We're the sons of God, children of God, people of God. Are the Jews people of God? No, they're not people of God. No. There's only one way to be a son of God. That is through faith of Christ. That's the only way. So that is the issue. That is the issue in the first century. And that is the issue, unfortunately, today in the so-called Christian world, even though he is very plain here, the children of God are those by faith in Christ, yet people say, well, no, the Jews are still chosen people of God. And you hear that all the time. And it is absolutely desecrating to the gospel. No, the sons of God are those who are by faith in Christ Jesus. That's how it was set up. And the law didn't change it at all. All right. Now, that's the point here. So, thinking about that, was, uh, was the church already the people of God? Yes it, yes, it was. The church was already the people of God. Was Judaism on the outside? Yes, it was already on the outside. That's very clear here. Judaism is already on the outside. Unless you're a child of God by faith in Christ, you're not a child of God at all. Right? That's, that's exactly, now, that's pretty explicit here, isn't it? All right, so they are not children of God, or the church, I should say, is not God's people only after 70. 
after the destruction of Jerusalem, they're already that way. So what does the point mean here? Settle the questions as to the sons of God. Well, the Jews thought they were still sons of God. But now Jerusalem is destroyed. No longer are they considered to be children of God, and they cannot be, really. Now, that's amazing to say that because so many people in the Christian world think somehow that Jews are still the children of God. But that's exactly what the text does not say. So now let's go to uh, Revelation. Let's just kind of find a parallel here in Revelation. One of them is chapter 10 and verse 7. And then we're going to go to chapter 7. Now this is, uh, and we'll see how the outline flows in just a few moments. This is the summation of all that has taken place in the destruction of Jerusalem, which I take Revelation to be an expansion of. He tells us in verse 7, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then is finished the mystery of God, according to the good tidings which he declared by his servants the prophets. What did the prophets prophesy of? What did all the prophets prophesy about? The, okay, the coming of Christ, all the Old Testament prophets. Let's look at a couple of passages real quickly. This is in Matthew, and this is 23. All of the prophets prophesied about one thing as far as destruction is concerned. And this is, we'll start at Matthew 23, and we'll start at verse, um, verse 32, where Jesus, knowing that the cross was looming before him, said to the Jews, fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you offspring of vipers, how shall you escape the judgment of hell? Therefore, behold, I will send, I send unto you prophets, wise men, scribes, some you shall kill and crucify, some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Now here's the key phrases. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of Abel the righteous unto the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you slew between the altar and the sanctuary. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. All Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that kills the prophets and stones them to send unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee together as a hen gathers a chicken under her wings, but you would not. Your house is left unto you empty. All right. So what was Jerusalem or the Jews guilty of? What were they guilty of here in this text? Persecuting all the prophets. All of the prophets. All the prophets and wise men. They killed them. They killed every one of them. The same thing is the case in Luke chapter 21. He makes a comment that is here. <clears throat> And I'll just uh, look, look at it real quickly. Just, we don't need to turn necessarily to it. But he tells us about the, uh, the same thing. Well, <clears throat> let's see. This is verses uh, 20 and following. Uh, verse 22, actually. For, for these are the days of vengeance. All things that are written may be fulfilled. All things that are written. Where, where were they written? Old law. The Old Testament predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he tells us in verse 24, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, be led captive into all the nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. All of that refers to the, this generation and the Jewish people at that time. But they were guilty of all of the blood from all of the prophets and all of the wise men that had gone before. And they would be taken out on that generation. So that's, that's the particular point here. Revelation 10 and verse 7. They were the ones guilty. This is the finish, the mystery of God that he declared by his servants, the prophets. All right, let's go back to chapter 7 for just a moment and notice one, something else here. Before the destruction would take place, God sealed on foreheads people for protection, protective custody. And that's what chapter 7 is about. And he tells us the sealing of the 144,000. But you'll notice we had uh, verse 4. He tells us the number, that's the number, 144,000. And he tells us they came out of the tribes of Judah. That's verse 5. Reuben, 
See that verse 5, latter portion? And all the way through the tribes, down to verse 8, tribe of Benjamin, all of these. And then he says, also, there was also a great multitude, which no man could number, out of every nation, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. All right, what is the point here? <clears throat> the point is that they were the ones protected by God, in a sense that would be simply they're marked as children of God in the destructive times. And that's what we have here. So the question is the sons of God are those who are faithful to Christ. And that's what Revelation gives us. So it settled the question as to the sons of God. Who are, who are the ones protected? Well, in the destruction of Jerusalem, <clears throat> this is interesting. Jesus said, when you see these things taking place, that is, Rome compassed with armies. I want you to do what? What did he tell them to do in Jerusalem? Christian people, I want you to do something. To head, out of the town. head out. Flee. Get out. And here, Revelation 7 shows us that number that was able to get out. It's a figurative number, to be sure. It's not literal. But it is simply showing us those of the Jews who are faithful to Christ, plus other people, They'd be protected by God in the destructive powers that came upon Jerusalem. So it settled the question as to is the, who are the sons of God? And the Jews themselves went through a horrifying massacre because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. So that's what the importance of the fall of Jerusalem is all about. All right, any, any thoughts on that before we change gears here for just a moment? We, well, you know what Josephus tells us, they went to a place called Pella, P-E-L-L-A, which was on the eastern side of the Jordan, I think it's the eastern side of the Jordan River, which was just north and by northeast. And so they fled in that direction. And that's how Josephus puts it, that Christians fled to Pella, P-E-L-L-A. It's kind of interesting. You've read Josephus, I think Stanley has, and you might have read that, how he said that Christians got out and went to Pella. Kind of it, fascinating, really, how Josephus shows us a contemporary historian. Now, Josephus, remember who he was. He was a Jewish general captured by Rome in the wars as the wars broke out in 66. And uh, so he was a captive. And he wrote about the history of the Jews. He wrote about his own people, even though he was in prison, Roman prison. So that's how Josephus describes it. All right, let's go on to the next particular, and that would be just a quick overview of the apocalypse. Now, this is, <clears throat> this is simply to illustrate generally what we have as far as the first half and second half. So I want us to get this very carefully. We have two halves of the book of Revelation. And these two halves are not to give us a successive timeline about one thing, then another thing, then another thing, then another thing, in that sense at all. That's not the way that Revelation is laid out. So for illustrative purposes, let me just point out that we have, for example, many times in the Scripture there are doublets that are given, two visions, two dreams, but they really mean the same thing, and they might emphasize different elements. For example... Remember, Pharaoh had dreams. He had two dreams, just as Joseph had two dreams. But the two dreams were not successive timeline of history. They were simply the same message emphasized in different fashions. What were Joseph's two dreams? Remember, Joseph had two dreams about his brothers. What did he dream? Number one, he said, I dreamed, or I dreamt that I... I uh, was the sun and uh, the moon and, and all the, and, uh, there are the moon and the stars all bowed down to me. So that, that was one dream. The other dream was that they were in the fields reaping wheat and they had these shocks of wheat standing up. And his shock of wheat was standing and all the other brothers, their shocks of wheat bowed down to him. Well, is that a successive timeline? No, it's just, it's just a doublet. That is to say there's two visions really pointing to the same message. So also with Pharaoh. Pharaoh had two dreams. What were his two dreams? Well, number one, he dreamed about cattle. Kind, remember? And he said he, had, he saw these cattle, 
and there were f fat cows, and then we have seven skinny cows, and the skinny cows ate the fat cows. He said, what does this mean? All right. Then he had another dream about corn. He said there was a field with corn, had a lot of corn that was ready to be harvested, and then there, were, there was another field with corn that was blasted and withered away, and this, this devoured, this corn devoured the other corn. Uh, what do these things mean? Well, the point is that both of the dreams pointed to the same particular facts. It's not a successive timeline. So also in Daniel. The book of Daniel, we have chapter 2. I hope you're familiar with Daniel's prophecies. Daniel, Daniel's prophecies, chapter 2, refers to the four kingdoms of the world, and in the fourth kingdom, that would be the Roman Empire, he tells us the church would be established. That would be bringing us down to verse 44. But now he comes over to Daniel chapter 7, and he says, okay, we have four animals. And remember, there's the bear, and then there's an indescribable beast, there's a leopard, and all of these animals, and it represented different kingdoms and what would take place. Now, what's, is that a successive timeline of history? No, it's just a, a duplication of the same message that we have in chapter 2, but it's under different figures. And we are able in that particular to see the different figures. For example, he shows us about the bear and uh, the bear standing up and having ribs in his mouth. Then he has this indescribable beast with iron claws and iron toes. And that kind of, well, it kind of relates back to what we have in chapter 2, the different elements of the kingdom. So all of this is to show us what? Same message, but we have different emphases within each message. This is exactly the way Revelation works. We have a vision, which is, and by the way, one of the first things we need to learn is that Revelation is Revelation. It's not Revelations, plural, it's Revelation. And so we, I hear people all the time, what does the book of Revelation say? No, there's no book such as that, none. It's Revelation. And the first message is chapters 1 through 11. And it emphasizes the church, uh, particularly the destruction of Jerusalem and the escape of Christians out of Jerusalem. All right, then we have the second half, which emphasizes more the church than Jerusalem, and it emphasizes the church, but it has different emphases, but it's a doublet. It's the same thing. It's the same material, but it's presented in a different fashion, just the same as Daniel did with his four beasts. So Daniel presented the kingdom of God with a great image. Remember in chapter 2, he saw a great image, and it had head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. That represented four kingdoms. In the days of the Roman kings, that would be the fourth kingdom. God will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Now we come to chapter 7. He sees these four different animals. Uh, leopard, the uh, bear, the indescribable beast. Let's see, what was the fourth one? Four, the four animals. Well, all of these four animals represent the same thing. So exactly we have in Revelation. 1 through 11 emphasizes the destruction of Jerusalem and people escaping out of it. Chapters 12 to 22, it emphasizes more the church, but it's the same message presented in different figures in exactly the same fashion. Does that make sense? So that's how Revelation is presented. Now that, that, and all of it, of course, falls under the general rubric of these things are all shortly to come to pass. It's all a message that is very near at hand. And when we get to the letters to the seven churches, he'll emphasize that over and over and over again. These things are about to come upon you. These things are about to come upon the world. These things are about to happen. All of it, very near at hand. And, and so Revelation is a doublet. That's what it is. It's a doublet. One through, 1 through 11, specifically 4 through 11, and then 12 through 22. All right, now, here's a chart that will really bring this together, I hope, in our minds. Now, at this particular point, I don't want us to, okay, we can look at the, each chapter severally and say, what, what does this mean, what does this mean, what does this, I mean, if you want to say that, that's fine, we can ask anything you will, I'm happy to do that, but what I want us to do is simply to get the general picture and this is to demonstrate that both halves of Revelation refer to the same thing. 
but it emphasizes different things. It emphasizes different figures. So let's, let's look at it for just a moment. So you have, and I tell you what, one of them, one, the clearest, one of the clearest to me is the very bottom one. So you have, let's just look at it. Chapter 6, and this is the opening of the seals. This is the, the fifth seal. Now, <clears throat> when we come to an overview in just a moment, we'll look more at this. But as Revelation opens up, we're admitted into the throne room, throne room of God. And then, then who, can open the, who can open the book? Well, it's closed by seven seals, and only one can open the book. That's Christ. So he opens the book. And he does it seal by seal. And every seal that's open has a different thing that's happening. And all of them are destructive. The first four are destructive, the, right, the horses that are riding through. And the, the seals, are not, all right, they're just giving us different pictures of destruction. But when you come to the fifth seal, you have an interesting picture that is given. And I want you to see what it is. He opened the fifth seal, and I saw underneath the altar the souls of them that had been slain... For the word of God. All right. Now, why had they been killed? Slain means murdered. Murdered for the word of God. Why, why had they been murdered? Because they were Christians. They, were not, they didn't just die in their beds peacefully. They were slain. They were murdered for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a great voice, How long, O Master, the holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? How long do you not avenge it? All right, what, what do they want? They want vengeance upon those who had murdered them. And they cry, and notice where they are. They're underneath the altar. He tells us that in verse 9. You see that? The altar. This is a picture of the temple area, and underneath the altar, they have been slain for the word of God, and they cry, how long? How long are you going to wait before you give vengeance upon those that live on the earth, those who are still living, the ones that murdered us? Okay. And there was given to them each one a white robe, it was said unto them, they should rest for a little time until their fellow servants also and their brethren who should be killed even as they were would have fulfilled their course. Just to wait a little while, wait a little while, here's what's going to happen. Now, does everybody get the picture there in Revelation 6? I don't want to go too quickly here. All right, so we have souls that have been beheaded or slain for the word of God. They ask for vengeance. Now let's go to chapter 20. Here is the sugar stick of premillennialists. But really, if we get this picture right here, then I think we're well on the way to understanding what Revelation 20 is all about. If we just get this picture right here. So let's go to verse 4. That's what we have on the chart there. All right. John says, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. Hmm, I wonder who that is. Judgment. Now, judgment means adjudication. The adjudication finally was given to them. All right, what, what adjudication was given to them? Well, the souls of them that had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. Well, who, who are those? Well, the ones we met in chapter 6. They were slain under the altar. They cried for vengeance. Now he says, I'm, I'm giving them this vindication. And now they are on, not under the altar, but where? On thrones. Is it literal? No, it's simply to show there's vindication of a cause. There's a vindication of a cause here, and that cause, of course, is Christianity. That's the idea. On thrones is not literal, no more than under the altar is literal. It's simply a, an apocalyptic picture of the fact that people were killed for Christ, and now we have vindication. And that's what Revelation 20 is about. Isn't that simple? And that brings it all together. But the point is, it ties it all together from chapters 1 through 11, because that was had in chapter 6. Now we come to chapter 20, the same thing, and he finishes the picture. And see how that works? And that's how Revelation is going to work continually. We'll have a picture here given in the first half, and you'll have, an, you'll have a picture over here given that's corresponding to it. And that's what this chart's about. All right, any question on that particular regarding Revelation 6 or Revelation 20? 
Does that help in understanding what Revelation 20 is not about? <laughs> Number one, it does not mention you or me. Revelation 20 doesn't. Unless, you're, uh, unless you've been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. It doesn't mention the land of Palestine, does it? No, it has nothing to do with Palestine, sitting on thrones. It doesn't mention Jesus Christ at all in this picture at all, does it? And yet, premillennialists say that's, that's what includes, it includes all these things. It includes Jerusalem, they say. Well, it doesn't say anything about Jerusalem. Nothing about Jerusalem. Nothing about Christ sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. Nothing about the land of Palestine. Nothing about you are there. It's about people who have been murdered for Christ and the cause is vindicated. That's what we have in chapter 20. So, chapter 20 right there, you can see what it obviously does not refer to. Now, let me just say this. This passage I said at the beginning of this particular segment is a sugar stick of all premillennialists. Because this passage, here's how they do it, okay? They're sitting on thrones, and that, that means, okay, they're all in Jerusalem, literally, Jesus is on his throne. It's in Jerusalem. It's in Palestine. We're going to refurbish the law of Moses. It's going to start up the law of Moses all over again. And this is going to be in the future, the millennium, and we're all going to go there. And it's about me and you. Isn't it interesting, the very passage in that one, they used to interpret the rest of the Bible. Everywhere. Now we see that. that they have their ideas, and now they go all over the Bible, and they, and they bring all these things into it. And the passage itself mentions none of these things. It's amazing to me, but that's premillennialism. Truth of the matter is, it's simply a finishing of the picture of chapter 6. So it ties it all together. So let's go back to the beginning of it, the chart that is. And we have, remember, the revelation of the Lamb, the first half, and the revelation of the bride, the second half. So we have, number one, the angel of the abyss. So let's, once again, not getting down to all the details, as I kind of did right there myself. Let's just glance at some of these things. Chapter 9 and verse 11. It's kind of interesting here. <clears throat> we have uh, the king... Over them as king, the angel of the abyss. And he's talking about those who are making war when the fifth angel sounded. Now, that would be chapter 9, verse 1. And we have the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destroyer. And in the Greek tongue, he has a name, Apollyon, which, of course, is the same. All right, but let's just, instead of fleshing out that picture, just turn over here to chapter 12, and verse 3. And I'm suggesting that we have in chapter 12 and 3, the great red dragon, seven heads and ten horns, is simply another picture of the angel of the abyss, who I take to be Satan. We found that in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, a star fallen from heaven. He is called a destroyer, verse 11. But in chapter 12, we don't have that angel of the abyss here. We have the great red dragon. A different picture, to be sure, but a reference to the same thing. So let's, let's go down, look at these. Here's another passage I think is pretty clear. We looked at chapter 7. Chapter 7, verses 4 through 8, we had 144,000 that are sealed out of every tribe of Israel. Sealed that is protected from destruction. And then you have... After the 144,000, you have a great multitude, verse 9, that no one can number out of every nation, language, and tongue. So it includes more than 144,000, right? That's important. Why is that important? When you have people knock on your door, say, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, and we want to talk to you about the 144,000. Where do they get it? Revelation 7 and they say that there are only 144,000 ever going to be saved, period, end of story. And they were marked in 1914. That's when it all started, it was all really fulfilled. And we want to make sure you're one of the 144,000. Well, nothing to do with Revelation. That was just, that just throws it out of everything out of whack, everything out of key. It's not referring to that at all. But look at here. When you have this one, now let's go to chapter 14. And you will see 
The same thing in chapter 14. Let's start at verse 1. I saw, behold, the Lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having the, the, his name, the name of his Father, written on their foreheads. Where, what's 144,000? Well, it came out of chapter 7. The sole point is that both halves are referring to the same thing. They're tied together. It's not a successive storyline. You see the 144,000 here? You see it in chapter 14. Isn't that pretty picture? I mean, as far as simple picture, getting it together. All right, then you have chapter 8 and 9, seven trumpets. Now, we don't ne need to necessarily turn to it. You can if you'd like. Seven trumpets that are blown. Now, at first... You have, uh, if you go back here to chapter, uh, well, we'll just mention it. Chapter 6, he starts opening the seals. There's the book, the scroll that's written, and the seals, seals, are, seals are on it. Seven seal is opened, and now he, he breaks it down to seven trumpets. So it's just, it just takes seven seals, giving us a vivid picture of destruction, and, then, and the souls that are under the altar. And then you have, breaks it down to seven trumpets. It's just kind of, it's kind of putting off, it's a, it's a drama. It's just putting off what's the inevitable, that is the final destruction. All right, now that's how it's laid out. But when you come to chapter 15 and 16, you have no longer seven trumpets, but you have seven, what? Bowls. And these are angels. They're simply pouring bowls of wrath out. Is it a different picture? Well, it emphasizes different things, but it's basically the same judgment scene. And so it ties both of these halves together. Here's one also that's, I think, pretty important, and that is in chapter 11. So now let's, uh, let me stop here. Have we gone too quickly? Do we need to stop? And let's, okay, let's pick up pieces before we move. All I want us to do is get a general picture that we have two halves, chapters 1 through 12, or 1 through 11, and 12 through 22, tied together. All one congregation here, see? Whether you're sitting on my le right, left hand or sitting on my right hand here. All one congregation. Yes, ma'am. The seventh seal opened, and it was broken down into seven trumpets. That's correct. Say again. The angels would blast the trumpets... But I, I hasten to add this. Things such as the angels are, are simply, a simply window dressing of apocalyptic material. It's, so so I, think we talk, I think Ray even asked last week about the angels. So let's not, let's not think, okay, who is, what is, what is this, who is this angel? You know, it's, much of the material is simply picturesque destruction and are not to be understood literally that we're going to have an angel actually blasting on a trumpet but it is simply a pictorial directory of destruction does that make sense so I I, I you know I because it's easy to get down into the details let's, okay let's go down to the weeds here and let's figure out this and this and this if we get the general picture and understand that what apocalyptic literature is about. Just, just for example, it, at chapter 1, we'll have Jesus pictured as a lamb standing. Well, literally, no, he's, it's just a, giving us a picture. And it shows us, um, for example, you might just glance at chapter 1. He shows us uh, how he's dressed, for example. It says he was clothed, um, clothed the garment down to the foot, he has on his breast a golden girdle, head and hair are white as wool, white as snow, his eyes a flame of fire, his feet burnished brass. Okay, this is, this is only a picture to get you to think about Christ. It's not say, you know, this is what you're going to see when you get to heaven. It's not anything like that. It's just it's fleshing out an apocalyptic imagery. And that's the same thing as with the angels. Simply apocalyptic imagery. Seven trumpet blasts only are successive, or I should say, different 
avenues of destruction that are taking place. So seven seals opened. Is it just seven pictures of destruction? Seven blasts of trumpets? Seven pictures of destruction. And that's all that it is. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But I think that, I think that if we get down to, okay, like, okay, what is it? Theater is burnished brass. So what could that mean? Well, I think, we're, I think we're missing the point here. It's just a picture. All right. Anyway, that's my understanding of it. I'm not saying you've got to follow me. You, you might find something a little bit more edifying than that. I don't know. But, all right. So let's look at uh, the temple of God in heaven. Oh, no, the great city, the city where the Lord was crucified. Here, here we have, I think, one of the clearest, aside from chapter tw 6 and chapter 20, one of the clearest statements. But this one here is about Jerusalem. And he tells us in verse um, verse. 19, well, actually, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 8. We're on that one. Verse 8. So, <clears throat> their dead body shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. I take it there that it's a reference to Jerusalem, and I think it's pretty simply that city that's referred to. Now, here he calls it a city. There's a city that is featured here. And the city is called Sodom and Egypt. Well, what is the city called in the second half of the book? Not Sodom and Egypt, but what? Well, let's go over here and find it. The great city, chapter 17. In chapter 17, whether it be verse 18 or chapter 18 and 18, the woman whom you saw is the great city. Good morning. The great cities, chapter 17 and 18. What's the great city? I take it to be Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Wasn't Jerusalem referred to as the great city during that time? Well, it was by secular writers as a great city. Uh, not only did Josephus refer to it that way, but other cities did as well. And you might note here, it tells us in 17 and 18 that it reigns over the kings of the earth. The idea of ruling... Kings, it's princes of the land. Remember we talked about the word earth? It really is translated as land. It rules over the princes of the land. How did, how did Jerusalem rule over the princes of the land? Well, when they brought Jesus before Pilate, who, who orchestrated that? The Jews did. Did they manage Pilate? Did they pull his strings? Yes, they did. And that was continually the case. They always, always managed, manipulated the kings or the princes of Israel. That's what, or of Rome that we're in, located there. So that's the idea. We have a great city in the first half and a great city in the second half. Let's look at chapter 18 and verse 18, talking about the great city. I've already gone over time, haven't I? <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, you know what? Here's, here's the phrase great city right here, Joy, in 18 and 18. What city is like? The great city. And I take it as Jerusalem. Same as chapter 11. So all we're demonstrating here is that we have two halves emphasizing perhaps different things here and there, but really it ties it all together. It, there are two different pictures, and as we began this particular lesson, just as we have doublets in Joseph's dream, doublets in Pharaoh's dream, doublets in Daniel's visions, we have a doublet here, chapters 1 through 11, chapters 12 through 22. So, that should set aside one particular important fact, or one important thing. And that is, that this is not a successive timeline of history taking us all the way down to the end of time. That's how a lot of people take Revelation. And a lot of our own brethren have taken it that way, so they, and remember the historical method is to line things up with, okay, Muslim conquering the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire conquering, and then we have uh, then we have coming over here in the time of Napoleon and uh, the time of the popes and just kind of running it all the way down the timeline. I just think that's a, a wrong approach to the book of Revelation. All right. Any question you have? Any mention? Now, I, I, could, I could have this uh, chart copied if it would be helpful. I could just copy this. You can look at it, take your own notes on it. I didn't pass out anything this morning, but that may, might be helpful. So, Okay. Thank you for your participation.